foul things up, you need to have a computer or scripture. That is, that is so true. It, our scripture today is uh, from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came from the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of a man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Don't you think it's fair to say, oh, by the way, sorry about you dropping off, Steve. I feel your pain and thank you for doing that reading. But wouldn't y'all say it's fair? It's fair and it's true that we would say we have ordinary times in our lives. You have an ordinary week. Maybe you even have an ordinary month. Nothing special stands out. Um, but it's also true that the extraordinary breaks into our lives suddenly, unexpectedly. Um, and I want to tell you a story about an elderly colleague of mine. Early in my years as a licensed lay minister in the United Church of Christ, when I was working at um, the United Churches of Olympia, there was an elderly pastor there who I could tell he just didn't quite approve of me. I was way too energetic and occasionally I would swear and that was just not ladylike enough for him. And um, his life changed. He was diagnosed with cancer and suddenly his pedantic sermons became poetry and his life with his wife, which is, had always seemed proper and restrained, all of a sudden, his love for his life just shone through him and everyone could see it. Everyone heard it and saw it every time he looked at her. And one day he told us all as he was preaching and it was a large congregation, so he was preaching to hundreds of people. And he told us all that cancer had changed his life. And he knew that it would be an uncomfortable thing for us to hear, but he said, I wish all of you could learn from having cancer too. And, you know, he went on to live many more years. And I believe in all the years that he had left, at least the years in which I saw him, he was different. His life went from sort of a drab self-acceptance and certain white male presumptions that he didn't even know he had to something new and surprising and different and totally amazing. He saw the world differently. And in that one sermon, which I will never forget, he wished all of us to see it differently true too. Because the world he saw because of his cancer, became a world of astonishing brilliance and beauty, and it was in every way extraordinary. I realize he was grateful to his cancer for dragging him out of his stuffiness and his uptight sense of entitlement and judgment. But to this day, I also believe that you do not have to have a diagnosis like that to learn about the amazing and dramatic and extraordinary reality 
that is our world. I want you to think about it. I want you to rack your memory for the last time that you were just sort of tipped off center. You were somehow shaken by the unexpectedness of your life. Surprise, boy joy. Suddenly engulfed in beauty. Can you think of it? Has this pandemic helped you with that? Has it helped you feel or see or experience life differently? For me, again, it has been the birth of my third grandchild, my first grandson. Or maybe for you, it was the death of someone very beloved. Maybe it happened because there was a significant change to your most intimate relationships. Don't let cancer be your first teacher. It can be as simple as getting on a bus and riding with your eyes open, seeing all of those people on the bus with you as unique, astonishing humans. Wait, only as long as the next summer rainstorm that comes roaring in and breaks up the heat of a hot day. Or maybe it's just as simple as, as it was for a baby Christian's parents who texted Jim and I in a flurry of energy because baby Christian had rolled over for the first time. It can be that simple. The reminder that life is extraordinary. Now, we don't know what the gospel doesn't tell us, but something caused Peter to see with new eyes. Jesus says it is the very power of God that has allowed Peter to have the wisdom to see Jesus differently. He sees Jesus as more than the sage, the teacher, the healer, the rabbi. Somehow he acknowledges him with the divine spirit of God pouring out of him, a very son of the most high God. And you know, the gospel also doesn't tell us, but I wonder what Peter was like for days after that, if, if he saw everything differently, if he went around just staring at things, looking at everything with wonder, with this new vision that he had, seeing it all with fresh eyes, eyes that saw the glory and the wonder of God in everything. So this is what I believe. You don't have to get cancer and you don't have to be Peter to see the world this way. The Buddhists call it the moment of enlightenment and within Islam, it is called understanding the will of Allah. And for Christians, many would say that it is finally realizing that God is love. You do have to be open and you have to be open to that which is greater than your own understanding. You have to be open to being taught by others and by life. You have to be open to what Francie gave you in the centering prayer this morning. Rest, be, trust your body, let go. You have to be willing to learn from our kids, from Anna this morning get into her world and be willing to learn from her truth. I hope that when I preach and when I try and teach, I do so with humility and the understanding that I am also learning even as I share what I teach with you. And I think it is in the way we pray together when we lift up 
and hold each other both in joy or sorrow. Without humility, there is error and suffering and terrible mistakes. And I think this is abundantly true in this text. Because, you know, Jesus insists that they keep quiet about this revelation of his identity. Now, why? Why not shout from the rooftops? At last, at last, here comes God's messenger. Here comes the one to answer our generations of desperate prayer. He heals us. He feeds us. He stands up to the hypocritical and the corrupt. Yay! Let's shout it. Well, wait. Because <laughs> the next thing you know, you know what's going to happen, right? The next thing will be plan to raise an army and drive those oppressive Romans into the sea. And they'll be the disciples themselves arguing and dreaming about sitting in power. Who will sit at Jesus's left? Who will sit at Jesus's right hand? And they will reign in power in Jerusalem, the city of the kings. And they will offer the sacrifice of the rams and the cattle in the inner sanctum of the temple of Jerusalem. Oh my gosh. The extraordinary vision of Peter can become almost immediately horribly distorted by human ego, by human pride and those small sectarian visions. My people, my religion. It's distorted by our human tendency to be dominating and our long embedded pattern of resolving our differences to violence. But it's humility that is needed. And it's teachers that we need. And it's the slow wing down and the discernment and the open heart that we need. It is the pattern of Jesus's life, death and resurrection that we need to see, to follow. It's so, it's far too easy. It's so, so easy for us to take a phrase, a thought, one image, Peter's one vision, and then build a whole kingdom of mistakes around it. That phrase from the Gospel of Matthew that Steve shared with you, I'll quote it. I tell you, you are Peter, the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Those short phrases have created one of the world's greatest hierarchies of power that have ever been seen. The Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, which is known all over the world and sometimes revered and sometimes reviled, but its followers and its cathedrals are everywhere. And it is in the very bones of Western history. Its power and its corruption cannot be hidden. Did Jesus plan all that? When he said those few sentences to Peter, in Peter's moment of wisdom, of Peter's moment of enlightenment, I don't believe it. Not even for a minute. And yet, here it is. This ancient, ancient, ancient institution of prayer, sometimes, and power, always, there are members within the Roman Catholic communion who are some of the greatest saints of the human family. And yet that same institution is steeped in injustice 
and violence, imperialism, and misogyny? It's not the only example we can think of. There are other examples of power and a lack of humility really close to home. All we have to do is look at white supremacist attitudes and white imperialism around us. Spewed by people of fear and ignorance, people out there who refuse to acknowledge the significance of science. And I'm talking about whether they refuse to wear a mask because of the coronavirus or because they refuse to and they ignore the science of the age of the earth or they are swayed into deep state conspiracy theories. Folks without humility and folks who are fearful and closed of heart say things like, I don't need science. I don't need to listen to you. I don't need to read that. It is a mixture of arrogance and deep, profound fear. We need humility. We need humility when listening to the gospel stories of Jesus. We need to be students of those stories and we need wise teachers around those stories. God has created us to see the extraordinary in everything. And God delights in this extraordinary creation, in all of its dizzying diversity, its variety, its beauty, its mystery, its complexity. Let us approach it with reverence, and humility. Let us come with open hands, not clenched fists. Let us open our hearts and our minds. And even if our hearts break, let us vow to keep them open. Let's give ourselves to this world in love and in sharing light, in healing, and in feeding, in working for justice, in living for peace. This is the extraordinary path of Jesus. It is in loving service and in humility. Let us walk it. Amen.